Good morning, everybody. My name is Brian Hoare from Zitali, and I'd like to welcome you to this session on mainframe modernization at impact. Hopefully everybody is well and all is good. Mainframe modernization is one of those topics where a lot of people consider, hey, let's get off of the mainframe. How do we do it? I'm going to turn that around and say, how can we help keep the mainframe and give you some suggestions and some ideas? Hopefully they'll be thought provoking on how we can make better use of the mainframe. Um, the mainframe is a continual improvement process. So let's see what we can do. For my sins, I've been around the mainframe industry for 30 plus years. I first started out on OSMFT. So that will probably give you an idea of uh, how long I've actually been involved with it. All right, so let's get going. I work for a company called Zitali who are based in France. We have offices all over the world. We've got two here in the States. We've been around since 2006. And the two big pieces of news about us, and this will be my last little bit of Zitali, is one, we've got new products coming out this year. And last year in October, we had a name change. We went from Z cost management to Z tally. And I'm sure a number of you know us, know of Z cost, but you were thinking, who is Z tally? So hopefully now you know. My agenda for today, I'm going to talk about mainframe modernization, challenges, strategies, optimization, economics. How can we get more out of the mainframe? What is the cost? Think about, consider the, you know, two or three things, whether it's analytics, whether it's reduced costs, whether it's resources, all of these things need to be thought about because if we continually work to improving them, we're going to get more out of it. Some ways to put these strategies into place and some of these ideas. Uh, Q&A will be at the very end of today's session. Um, but please, as we go through, just jot your questions down and then just ask them or send them through on the chat. I love this slide. I really do. I think this is great because it really sums up the mainframe and how important it is. As it says at the top, they are mainframes are critical for many companies. This meant 30 billion transactions a day, the amount of business data that touches Z, it's, it's phenomenal. And when somebody says to you, hey, the mainframe's too expensive, and I'm sure your management come to you and say, hey, we've got to look at ways of reducing costs. 68% of the production for only 6% of the, of the whole IT budget compared to um, other platforms and sources. Hey, that is cheap. That is really good. Let's start off with a question for you. You know, this is um, I don't, this is something I like to do and say, okay, we're all mainframers. When was the first IBM mainframe released? It was an IBM 701. Now the latest one's a Z15. Now, please don't Google it and I'll give you 10 or 15 seconds to think about it. But if you could just answer in the chat window. So the question is, when was the IBM 701, <coughs> excuse me, released? 1952. Now that is scary, isn't it? If you think about it, a mm, lot of things have changed, but some of the things are still very much the same. Log data is one of them. All right, let's talk about the strategic, the mainframe, what it's doing. Hopefully you'll like my little picture of an IBM 360, I think it is. In the US here, there is probably a, approximately 12,000 companies that use the mainframe. Most of those 75, 80% have been outsourced. So there is a very, very high percentage of outsourcing in one format or another. It may not be a full outsourcing, but the point remains, even if they've been outsourced like partially or fully, it's strategic for them. It's a really important part of their business and their IT strategy. There's lots of surveys, lots of polls out there. 
Um, like most of us, we probably are a little cynical towards some of these polls. However, 56% of the one we're using here say they plan to increase their Z usage over the next two years. 36% say they plan to stay on the same. Consider it. If you've got a mainframe, you've probably had one for 30, 40 years. Not all companies, but a lot of companies. And there are new companies moving into Z and main and mainframe usage. Um, the Looking at this, IBM have done a phenomenal job because they've really improved the technology. With the advent of Z15, or I guess the Z10 onwards, the technology performance optimization on the mainframe has improved tremendously. The costs have come down. And I'll come on to that a little bit later, but they really have done an exceptional job. There's my picture of a Z15. The mainframe future. The mainframe has got to become a lot more agile. There are issues there. There's always going to be challenges. Let's call it challenges, not issues. About the agility of the mainframe and DevOps tools. I'll give you an example. My son works for a non-Z environment. And I was talking to him and I said, hey, look, when you need to get a change into production, how long does it take? And his comment was, well, sometimes we can do it in two hours, three hours, four hours. And I kind of scratched my head and thought, wow, how long does it take to do that on a mainframe? Multiple signatures to get approvals, no doubt, especially if it's something like DB2, and wait to the next maintenance window, and then we can probably do it. It just does not happen that quickly. However, there are a number of new techniques and automated processes that are coming out by some of the by IBM themselves and some of the ISVs that are making this a lot easier. So the mainframe is moving along that agile methodology. I like this next bullet point because it also gives me an example to give a real life example. 60% of users consider that improving the cost efficiency ratio per transaction is a challenge. There's a company that I'm working with um, 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 and they have said, okay, look, we've upgraded the coupling facility. They turned on a new engine. That wasn't a cheap exercise, but they did it. And their coupling facility has improved by 5%. Great. The next question they had was, how can we now prove that our Kix transactions have improved as well? They're going quicker, less uh, CPU seconds. They're, they're tr struggling to do that. And also, not only the uh, CPU seconds, but how much money is it saving them? Now, you can do a correlation from CPU seconds to dollars, but depending on the IBM type of license they're on, can be a little bit tricky. So they want to be able to do this to prove it. Now, they all have a feeling that they know it's improved, but they've got to be able to measure it. In the old saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So we're working with them all going to get through this. Uh, however, it's something that needs to be done. So they're improving their uh, cost efficiency ratio per transaction, and, and it's something that's going to help justify the existence of the mainframe. Mainframes have always been oh, that, that box in the corner that just is very expensive, the TCO. When you buy anything for the mainframe, hardware, software, typically, at least it's a six-figure sum. You buy a server and it can be a lot, lot less. So mainframe acquisitions or, or hardware, software for the mainframe usually come under a lot more scrutiny. However, if you consider that some of these companies out there have tens of thousands of servers, start adding them up and the mainframe starts to become quite inexpensive. That's why I showed you that the value of the mainframe in that slide very early on. And when your manager comes to you and says, hey, we need to reduce costs, the mainframe's too expensive, show him or her that. IBM billing, 
And again, IBM have done a tremendous job here. And I, I, I really think they've really tried to reduce the TCO. IBM billing model is a challenge. Most companies have an IBM license model, AWLC, or if they're, they're not on it at the moment, they've been on it and they're moving to, uh, they've moved to uh, one of the more complex models. Uh, AWLC is really about, hey, you pay for what you get, the more MSUs you use, the more you pay. That's not strictly true, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, this isn't the right time to, 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 to do an argument on that. However, IBM over the years have brought out multiple different types of billing models. They've improved the efficiencies and the performance and the optimization of their hardware. So you really do need to get on top of the different types of billing that IBM have to offer. If you don't fully understand it, or you are considering it, or you just want to talk to somebody about it, there are people out there, companies out there that know a whole raft about it, whether it's AWLC, whether it's VUE, CMP, mobile, TFP, and some companies also have multiple different IBM licensing options. So what is the effect of the bill? And then, and I'll cover this a little later, but if you, you have a workload, you've got multiple IBM license options, you want to then upgrade to a new CPU, you know, a Z13 to a Z15, what effect is that going to have on your costs? Understand the IBM billing model. Um, I do a session on this, not today, but I do do another session and I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. All righty. A lot of the mainframe applications have stayed the same. They've kept them, hey, that application works. We're not going to upgrade it, apart from work with the latest version of ZOS or CICS or whatever. But we're having to build front ends to it so it can integrate to non-Z platforms, make it visually a lot easier to use, because a lot of people don't want to use 3270s. It comes at a cost. There may be a large increase in workload on these applications and on the overall workload, but the legacy applications, they're solid, they're robust, they work, but they are costing money. So again, depending on what it is, we need to work with it. So we do need to be able to take the data from it and visualize it. Agility. IBM used to have you know, they've released maybe two major updates a year. A lot of companies now are saying, or a lot of companies did say, hey, that's not, that's not what we need. We need to have uh, upgrades or updates as we need them. And IBM released the RSU, uh, the release service update, where they send out updates on a very regular basis, monthly, for all of their IBM MLC products, DB2, IMS, CICS, et cetera, et cetera. These have caused another problem in the sense that some companies only have a very small maintenance window. And as I mentioned earlier, getting the sign off for all of these changes. If IBM are bringing out you know, one, two a month or one a month, getting time to actually implement that and put them in and test it in Q&A, et etc. et cetera, big job. That's one of the challenges with the IBM mainframe. There's also a loss of control with the mainframe. Consider going back, you know, let's go back 10 years, even 15 years. I would walk into a data center and, oh, yeah, there's a row of CICS systems programmers. There's a row of DB2 systems programmers. There's a row of ZOS systems programmers. Now, people are being asked to, be, to do dual roles, multiple roles, MQ, uh, IMS, et cetera, within a data center, and there is nowhere near as many people. Why are there no, not as many people? People are retiring, as I call them, the old, uh, the gray hair and the no hair brigade. People are leaving, they're retiring. It is a worry. However, again, the mainframe 
is coming to the fore and because it is so reliable and so robust and secure, a lot of people that have never had mainframe experience are starting to, especially as there's lots of new front ends, the visualization, being able to use it, extract the data is becoming a lot easier. I'm, I'm, personally, I think IBM and some of the ISVs are doing a super job with getting mainframe skills into the universities. The uh, people, when they come out, a lot of them do go back into the vendor world rather than go to the end user. But also uh, there are a lot of companies out there that are being outsourced. And I'm thinking of three that were outsourced from in a hall in November last year. A lot of the systems people, CICS people, DB2 people were just let go. Most of those got a job within two weeks of being let go. Granted, most of them knew that they were going to be let go and they stayed till the, the, their time had ended just so they would get an additional bonus. Good for them. But there is still work out there for the mainframe people. And CMG do a great job in, in, you know, if you get into the network, people know who's, who's, who's available and where there are spare jobs or new jobs. So again, loss of control. Talk about some of the economics. Companies are thinking, well, should we re-host? Should we re-platform? Should we go to the cloud? Should we outsource? Could we get rid of these applications and run them somewhere else by somebody else? Just get rid of it. We just take the data. People costs are always a concern. Could we put it out to other countries like India or China or Russia and do the work there? It is continually going. Move off to um, another type of platform, open source all these things to consider. Some of the biggest savings are in the IT tools optimization. Most organizations have got a stack of software on the mainframe and I've got a database that I can look up and I can see, okay, this is company X, Y, this is all the software they got. It's not only mainframe, but it's also all the non-mainframe software as well, but I can see a huge amount of mainframe software. Organizations are starting to swap them out. For example, I may have all my mainframe or probably 70, 60% of it from IBM. They're too expensive, so I go to another company. And three or four or five years later, they flip back because their original vendor has become cheaper and more functional. And it's a continual gain. There are, if you've not done, gone down that path, which I'd be very, very surprised, there are some significant gains to be had. And you may say, well, I work for an ISV. It tends to happen more with the larger players, which I will not mention. Peak consumption optimization. And here's, a, here's another one that is really, it's, it's one of my favorites because with IBM licensing models, most companies have or had AWLC based on AWLC is based on the rolling four hour average. So whatever the peak cons consumption of workload is on that four hour, the highest four hour rolling average in the month, that's what they'll get billed on. Now, again, I'm not gonna sit down and give a lecture on how that works. I'm just going to guess everybody here has a very good understanding of that, but if you've got an environment with, you know, three or four or more multiple LPARs, uh, consider having a dynamically modifying defined capacity. So when an LPAR and its workload needs more MSUs, they can get access to them and they don't slow down. What does get slowed down is the workload that has a lower priority. Maybe it's a test, maybe it's a development work, but, 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 but it can save you money. And if you can model this, then, hey, you're going to save yourself anywhere from, 
you know, 5, 10, 12, I've seen it as high as 15, 16% of your NLC bill being reduced by implementing this. I've had a number of discussions with uh, systems programmers who I respect, and they said, ah, oh, we can do all this through WLM. Well, that's not, I don't agree with them, but hey, it's a good discussion. They manage it by service classes, but it's the point is it's a manual effort. They have to continually monitor it. Whereas if it's a dynamic, automated process of moving the DC up and down, it just happens when it needs to. Treatment optimization, look at your logs. Log data is hard to understand, but if you want to know anything about an organization and what it's a workload and what it's doing, it will create log data for it. The challenge is understanding and deciphering the log data. Look at your applications. There are performance and tuning application solutions out there. That can really optimize the throughput and it not only reduces costs, it gives better service to the end users. The new billing model, I've kind of touched on this already with uh, IBM. Uh, we go back 10, 15 years, what was the biggest issue with the mainframe? Hey, the mainframe's too expensive. Every time we do a CPU upgrade, we get hit really hard by the ISVs for capacity increase. IBM came along, they released magnificent mainframes that would reduce that CPU capacity increase quite dramatically. Consider how many MSUs you've got on the floor now. And I've just gone through this exercise with a company where there are 257 MSUs about nine years ago, and they're at 265 now. They have not removed any of the workload. The workload's increased over that time by about 45, 50%. How they've done it is they've upgraded their mainframe, their hardware, not only the mainframe, but memory and storage and arrays and coupling facilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's really done them well. So they haven't increased the MSUs and so their software upgrade fees have been minimal, which is great for them. Uh, TFP is a great new IBM license model. It came out in two, 2017. My suggestions to you on this is if you are an organization a mainframe organization and you are growing your msus consider it if you are not growing your, your, your msus then it's probably not for you however if you are considering growing uh, going to tfp and it was released originally in 2017 of three flavors then there was another flavor in 2018, which replaced one of the previous three initial releases. And then in 2019, there were two more releases that replaced the previous three or four, whatever you'd like to call them. They're based on growth and you have to commit to a certain amount of growth each year. The question I would ask you to consider is if you overachieve or underachieve that growth at the end of the first year or the second year or third year, what happens? What are the penalties? At the end of your agreement, and let's assume you're, let's say that your agreement is going to be for three years, what happens if you've overachieved or underachieved? Do you use it, lose it? Ask the question, get it in writing. IBM have done great and good for the community. They need the mainframe to be there. I could be, I could say that, hey, the, the reason it is because it's worth a lot of money to them. It's a cash cap. We all know that. But likewise, they're not in the business to lose money. They're there to make money. I'm a fan of TFP. However, understand what you're getting into. So let's talk about some of these strategies and let's put some of them into place. Mainframe modernization strategy, analyze the data. What data have we got? 
typically the best source of data on a mainframe is log data because everything creates a log whether it's the mainframe resources whether it's used for chargeback or costing we need to optimize what we have we need to do more with less and plan i'm a big fan of don't try the big bang approach you're not going to improve everything overnight break it down into small projects log data is in a lot of cases where you need to start a lot of non-z platforms are very much into analytics collect the data start looking at what's happened in the past where we are today where are we going absolutely spot on because a lot of data a lot of data centers are starting to use mainframe data consider that slide earlier on where we talked about i talked about how much mainframe data is production data up to 80 percent i think it was of production data touches the mainframe so why should we be using some of that data for our analytical ai bi machine learning projects on the mainframe, we've always done uh, operational analytics. We may not realize it, but we have. However, it needs to go to that next step of saying, okay, let's use this data to help drive the business, whether it's on the costing or the resource or integrating with non-Z data. A little bit about analytics, and this is not going to be an analytics in-depth education session, but let's talk about it. I, I quite like analytics. Mainframe creates so much data. Don't get caught up with big data. A few years ago, um, IBM had ah, big data, and they, they still talk about it. You Google big data and you'll get all sorts of information, especially from IBM. Great stuff. Don't get caught up in it. What do you want to achieve? How we, what are we trying to do with our resources? How are we trying to reduce our cost control? How can the data help? Every organization that I speak to these days has got a data scientist or a bank of them. They're the new thing that everybody's talking about. How do you want to use it? Start breaking it down, understand what you need to use. Start collecting it, whether it's CICS, whether it's DB2, whether it's both. Uh, NQ, all of it. Don't drown in it. Apply analytics to the data, and I'll come on to analytics in a second. The cost control part of this, look for areas to reduce expenses. IBM MLC is always going to be one of the first at the top of the list because it's such a large percentage of what your IT budget is. Keep it under control whether it's understanding the license model, who, what workload contributes to drive these bills up, understand it. Align with the business drivers, stay on budget. If you are going to change licenses, hardware, operating systems, you've got to make sure that you stay on budget, whatever it is, and keep track of it, especially if you commit to a license model that says, hey, over the course of the next 12 months, I'm going to grow my mainframe. Please make sure you keep track of that. So why should companies use ITOA, Information Technology Operational Analytics? Data is key to a competitive advantage. Company's ability to compete will be driven by how well it can leverage data by analytics and implement new technologies. Um, one of my favorite sayings is, or acronyms is DDDM, Data Driven Decision Making. Really sums up everything about it. If you're still not convinced that analytics is well worthwhile looking at or getting into, there's $430 billion, 430 billion reasons. Question I often ask, does your organization include Z data for analytical projects? As the source was Bernard Marr, and if 
you ever want a good read or listen to a good uh, recording, just Google him on LinkedIn. Analytics can be confusing. There's lots of different types. There's four key categories, descriptive, diagnostic, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. Descriptive is what happened. Diagnostic is why did this happen? The predictive is where? And prescriptive is very much what's the next steps? Now, again, I'm not going to go into these in real detail, but there are some great reads out there on this. And if somebody wants to know more about it, just, just drop me an email. There are lots of subcategories as well, and these can get very confusing. When I first started looking and I'm trying to understand what analytics, AI, BI, machine learning were, I was inundated with all sorts of information. I mentioned earlier on about breaking it down. Understand what you want to do. Understand what, try to work out what type of analytics you're doing. Because there's, again, there's lots of information. And if you've got data scientists in there, go talk to them. But you can see, we use some of these, you know, every day. Speech analytics. We've all heard of uh, uh, Alexa, um, who's always picking me up because I usually leave my cell phone by my computer. And then when I start talking, Alexa often jumps in. Buzzwords here. And again, <laughs> you got buzzwords, you got subcategories, you got categories. Hey, this is mind blowing. I am sure most of you are familiar with these terms, what they all mean. I'm sure you'll know some of them, but some of them you won't. And of course, I get onto a web page like most people do. And what's the first thing that pops up is a little chat bot. Personally, I'm not a fan of chatbots because I just think they're about as useful as an ashtray on a motorbike. Absolutely useless. However, I'm sure there are people out there that would disagree, but that's good. So you've got all this data. How do we solve this problem and what to do with it? Who, a lot of people don't have the slightest idea, but a lot of people do. Start looking at analytics and start using it for the business. Streamline your data management. Log data is where you all start for mainframe. Make sure that you're not pushing up your four hour rolling average. Um, in memory, capture to save mainframe IO and CPU. Reduce your storage requirements. Most companies have a performance monitor. Very good at solving the problems that go bump in the middle of the night. Are they good for reporting? Mm, my feeling is then that's not what their main aim is. They do some short-term reporting, but try to get long-term reporting to understand and use for analytical purposes, not what they're designed for. I'm not going to knock them. When things go bump in the night, you need them. Get you back on track so you can meet your SLAs. But a lot of those problems that go bump in the night can be solved if you know the pattern, if you can look at your peaks and troughs, and you can look at the data from two months, three months, four months, what happened last year. All right. So again, with all this massive amount of data, typically take it off the mainframe is the easiest way to do that. Start consolidating it all. And it's not just mainframe data, because start consolidating it with business data, with other platforms data that are sharing the same applications that you've got. Get the big picture with data models. Um, look at the dependencies between your applications. And again, a lot of the data scientists will be able to help you out with some of this. Associate technical data to its business content. Supercharge your data models with business metrics. You know, all of a sudden now you're starting to integrate with other applications and you're using mainframe data. BI. Everybody's talking about business intelligence. We do do it. As I'm sure, like me, you get a little bit frustrated. You go online, um, whether it's Amazon or any of the others, and then that particular, whatever it was you were looking at, pair of jeans, a T-shirt, new sound system, kind of follows you everywhere. Hey, come and have a look at this. Did you see this particular sound system? Do you want to buy it? Drives me nuts. 
Peaks and troughs, the anomalies. You're problem solving, you've had a problem in the middle of the night, you got over the problem, but let's start looking at the anomalies. Why did that occur? As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the problems, the issues that go bump in the night can be solved if you look at the peaks and the troughs and the trends. And that's where we start to come into uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, even VR. So let's have a look at cost control and some suggestions and ideas on what to look for. Questions for you. What will I pay for my current production? Got to keep track of it. Get in near real time historical data reporting, consumption and cost from contracts and pricing models and simulate, work out, okay, if we keep going along this path, am I going to be close to budget? What am I paying for it? Not only production, but dev, test, all the various categories you have within your environment. I'm a great believer in being able to justify any expenditure on the mainframe and go back to the business unit or the user and say, hey, did you know that you spent this amount of money in our environment? What can we do to reduce it? Because if they don't, then it's going to be more and more problems. Where do your costs come from? Not only by Alpa, but by workload. You have multiple machines. And I know some of the attendees do have lots of mainframes. Where do all the costs come from? Understand it. Cost factors, the trends, need to be able to manage it. And this is all very much operational analytics. Budget, this is the one that I, I pull my hair out with a lot of people. They don't, they, they do their budgeting, but they don't keep looking at it on a regular basis. It's almost like, okay, we only balance our personal bank accounts or credit cards you know, once every three months. You're gonna run into problems. Keep track of your budget, understand what's being spent. So you don't end up with an overrun. Contractual overruns. You've heard me talk about TFP, IBM licensing. What happens with you're in a IBM license agreement that you're committed to spending or buying X amount of MSUs because you're on one of these growth models? You want to stay as close to the line as possible. You don't want to exceed. You don't want to uh, go under. However, if you can then start modeling out what your workload is with various trends, because typically Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, you're going to have more variation. It's not going to be a steady path. And you could probably sit there and say, well, just about every month there's going to be a peak or a trough start planning them, knowing when they're going to happen so that when you do do your budgets and you don't get these contractual overruns. How do I know which pricing model to choose? Wow. This is, this is something that I really believe companies should start being much, much more focused on. You've got to, you run your stuff on a mainframe, you've got your multiple LPARs, you've got your multiple CPUs. Maybe the mainframe's coming to the end of its life. You had a three year or a four year lease on it. It's starting to get to that stage where it needs to be upgraded. Or you're an organization that upgrades every second generation. You go from a Z11 to a 13 to a 15 or a 12 to a 14, etc. Hopefully you understand what I'm trying to say. But what effect will that existing workload on that existing hardware have on a new piece of hardware and potentially a new license? And it's not only just the mainframe, it's the channels, it's the storage, it's all of those things as well. So you want to be able to sit there and say, hang on a minute, if we move this, these are the benefits we're going to get. Excuse me. And this is the cost it's going to be. Really important. So you need to be able to model, simulate. 
so that when you then go to the executive and say, well, we believe we're on a Z13, we need to go to a Z15, the MSU increases 2%, this is what we'll do for the business, this is how much money it will save, this is the ROI, this is the business case, you've got detailed data there. Focus in on it. One of my favourites, this is just magnificent. If you are on AWLC or CMP or even a hybrid IBM license option, and there are some out there, I found one that I hadn't come across, I had never come across, it was VUE license, but it was the, the company had VUE licenses, and but they were still charged based on the four hour rolling average each month kind of scratched my head, yes, and it was a perpetual license for MLC products. But if you've got a standard AWLC, which most companies have, or CMP, and even TFP to a certain extent, I say to companies, okay, do you understand, do you know what workload is contributing to the four-hour rolling average? Companies say, yeah, we do. We know what the workload is. And most of them get it displayed in MSUs. Okay, but how do you translate that into dollars? Oh, it's the same as what it was last month. Well, maybe there's a 1% variant. No, 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 no. I'm a great believer in every workload that contributes to the four hour rolling average. You need to understand it by dollars, money, the greenbacks. Understand that, and then you can say, hey, should this workload be running here? Should it be contributing to the four-hour rolling average? If not, move it out. If the answer is yes, and it contributes, say, two and a half hours through that four-hour rolling hour period, maybe you could reschedule it, and it'll only contribute for an hour and a half or two hours. It reduces your costs. And even if a workload has to run when it runs and it contributes to the four hour rolling average, go back to the business and say, do you realize you are, we are being charged this amount of money by when you run that workload? Can you help us work at, run it at a different time, but still meet the SLAs? The other part that once you identify this is you will always, I guarantee this, you will always find a workload that snuck in contributes to the four hour rolling average that really should not be there. A testing job, a development job, it could probably be run, you know, three hours later or four hours earlier, et cetera. Makes me laugh, I chuckle at this because, and I'll challenge any company out there that says, no, we've got this under total control. Every month there's something new that pops up. So in summary, use mainframe data, for IT operational analytics. It will help modernize the mainframe. Visualization as well, make it easier for people that are non-Z environment uh, aware. Align with the business and non-Z platforms. The mainframe is just a gigantic backend server in a lot of cases. It needs to be more aligned with the business and by doing some, taking up some of the suggestions, it's gonna help. People have said to me many times, we're going to get off the mainframe. I, say, I, I chuckle when people say that to me now. I say we, I chuckle with respect. But I've got friends that have said, we we're going to get off the mainframe 30 years ago. Guess what? They're still using it. Budget licenses, especially the IBM MLC licenses and manager costs. Keep track of them. Make sure you understand them and who's contributing to the four-hour rolling average. All right, just about to wrap up. So what are we saying? We're talking about service intelligence, analytics, keep track of your cost control, make sure that you've got all of your costs under control. Resource planning, if you're gonna to move to a new processor, make sure that the workload will be more efficient. If you do, help build your ROI. And automated capacity ensure that when a workload needs MSUs, it can get them, dynamically modify your DC, have a solution in place to do that, 
and so it will reduce your MLC bill at the end of each month. I would like to thank you for your time this morning, this afternoon. Uh, send the questions to me and I'll happily do that. And hopefully those that got my question right at the beginning about the IBM 701 will leave me with their email address and I'll make sure you get a gift card. For more information about me or Zitali, go to our website. And I would like to thank you very much for your time.